It's my pleasure to introduce to you our presenters for this session. We're joined today by Brittany and Kristen, who are with our Age and Growth Lab here in St. Petersburg. Brittany and Kristen, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jessica. Welcome, everyone, to 2020 Virtual Marine Quest. Um, again, my name is Kristen Reinerson, and I am joined today by my co-host and co-worker, Brittany Barbara. Brittany, can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> uh, we're going to tell you guys all about the Age and Growth Lab at Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, or FWRI. And to begin, we're going to start with a quick overview video of what we do here, and then we'll really explain the nuts and bolts of how our lab runs. So please enjoy a short video. Hi, I'm Jessica Carroll, and I'd like to welcome you to the Marine Fisheries Asian Growth Lab. Scientists in this lab work with other fisheries research sections here at the Institute to provide important data that help us to conserve Florida's fish populations. In this lab, we determine the ages of fish using a bone called the otolith. The otolith is found in the inner ear of a fish, and just like us, the fish use it for hearing and for balance. Unfortunately, removing the otolith is lethal because it's contained within the head of the fish just behind the brain. Thankfully, approximately 70% of the otoliths that we use for age and growth analyses come from the fishery. That is to say that the fish was captured either by a commercial or recreational angler and we were able to sample the fish and remove the otolith before the fish went to market or to the dinner table. The remaining 30% of otoliths that come to our lab for aging were captured using scientific sampling. These are often fish that are too big or too small to be captured within the fishery. The first step is extracting the otoliths from the head of the fish. The otoliths are then cleaned, dried, stored, and sent to our lab. We have Kristen Cook and Kristen Reinerson here today to walk you through the science of processing and aging otoliths. First, we mark the core on the otolith. And then we hot glue that otolith to a piece of manila folder. The otolith is then taken to our multi-blade low-speed saw which grinds through the bone and yields three cross sections at a time. Those sections are then placed on a microscope slide and are fixed to the slide using a liquid cover slip. The prepared otolith slide is taken to the microscope where transmitted light shines through the thin section. We are able to count the dark bands, which are the annual growth rings, to determine the age of the fish, just like counting the rings on a tree. Our Age and Growth Lab processes and ages about 30,000 otoliths per year from about 70 species of fish. These ages are combined with other data, including lengths, weights, reproductive information, mercury content, diet, and catch data. Our lab plays an important role in conserving Florida's fish populations because the ages we provide are critical to the stock assessment process. This is the primary source of information for management regulations. Age data are important because the lifespan of the fish is not the same across species. For example, here in Florida, spotted sea trout have been aged up to 10 years old, but their cousin, the red drum, have been aged up to 44. It's important that they aren't regulated the same. We also need to know how quickly fish grow, how big they are at certain ages, as well as the age structure of the population, that is, the number of fish at each age. These factors all go into the stock assessment process and management decisions for Florida's fish species, which is why the research that we do here in the Age and Growth Lab is so integral to the conservation process. Alrighty, can you guys still see and hear me? Brittany, can you see and hear me? There we are. There we go. Thank you guys for watching that video. We're gonna forge ahead. Um, we're going to take a deeper dive into what exactly it is we do. Um, the Age and Growth Lab has actually been in existence determining the ages of fish since the early 90s. We're a specialized group of scientists, currently four staff members and a lab manager, and we're all passionate about studying and conserving our marine fish species. FWRI encompasses labs located all around the state, as you can see here on this map of Florida and the headquarters is located in St. Petersburg. The Age and Growth Lab staff works out of the St. Pete location, but we collaborate with scientists from all our field labs. They send us the ear bones from fish caught all around the state. 
So if you look at this spotted sea trout here, to show you where the ear bones are located, we have an x-ray of this fish's head. Here comes our x-ray machine. <laughs> and that glowing white spot there, that is the otolith, and it is located um, behind the fish's eye socket near the brain. The more scientific word for this ear bone is otolith. So this word otolith, if you break down the Latin roots of the word, odo means ear and lith means stone, hence ear stone. Uh, but what exactly is an otolith? So it's a bone found within the inner ear of a fish. Yes, fish do have ears. They don't have external ears that we can see on the outside of their head like people do, but they have an inner ear system. The otolith helps the fish deal with hearing and balance. Just like as in humans, we have small crystals um, inside our inner ear that help us with hearing and balance as well. Um, in bony fish, there are actually three pairs of otoliths, but we use the largest of these pairs called the Sagitta otoliths for our research. And you can see those colored in orange on that diagram of a fish's head. Another feature about the otolith is that it grows bigger as the fish grows bigger. All baby fish are born with a tiny little otolith and it grows larger every single day as new thin layers of bone are deposited onto the otolith. Thus, the otolith gets bigger as the fish gets bigger. Also, otoliths grow at different, fish grow at different rates throughout the year and this creates growth rings on the inside of the otolith. Maybe in your science classes you guys have heard about how you can figure out how old a tree is by counting dark rings on the inside of the tree trunk. It's pretty much the exact same way with fish otoliths. Thanks, Kristen. So uh, it's important to point out to you guys that just because a fish is big doesn't necessarily mean that the otolith is big too. For example, the bottom three fish uh, in this picture here are inshore species. So they live in water that is maybe not as clear, and they need to rely on hearing and sound to find food in their friends. So that means they have really big otoliths for their body size. But the top three species in that same picture are pelagic species, so they live way offshore in open water where it's normally really clear. So they rely more on um, vision and less on sound to navigate their surroundings and find food. So they have pretty small otoliths for their really big bodies. Also, a uh, really cool fact, I want you guys to notice that not all the otoliths on this picture are the same shape. Uh, each species of fish actually has a slightly different shape of otolith. So in order for us to look at the growth rings on the otolith, first the otolith has to be extracted from inside the fish's head. So here's something that's pretty impressive. Um, the Age and Growth Lab in St. Pete processes and ages about 30,000 otoliths every year. But where do we get all these samples from? I mean, it would be pretty cool if we were out there fishing every day. But we get our samples from three main sources. 70% of our samples, the biggest chunk of that pie chart there, come from a group called Fisheries Dependent Monitoring. So these fish are caught by commercial or recreational fishermen for them to sell or take home for dinner. So these guys are sampled by our scientists who send the otoliths along to us, and the fishermen take the rest of the fish with them. The rest of our samples come from different scientific sampling, so fish that were too big or too small to be caught by the fishery. This ensures that we have otolith samples from all sizes of fish and all the species that we study. As a matter of fact, we actually age otoliths from 70 different species of marine fish, all shown here in this graphic. That's a lot of different species. So quick overview, we take the otolith, we cut out the center, and what we're left with is a nice beautiful cross section with the growth rings for us to look at. Um, but before we get to that really fun counting part, <laughs> we need to prepare the otolith properly. So earlier we showed you guys a video um, explaining how we do this, so I'm just going to go through this as kind of a quick refresher for you. So it's a lot easier to cut the otolith if first we glue it to a piece of stiff paper. It's also really important that we mark the core. That's the center of the otolith where it started growing with the baby fish. So then we use a special low speed saw that has four grinding blades. And that yields three thin cross sections of the otolith. And we use a liquid cover slip to cover the sections and secure them to the glass slide. And this obviously makes it a lot easier to look at under a microscope. Awesome, thank you, Brittany. Um, now that we have this thin cross section that Brittany explained what it takes to get there, we can determine the age 
that a fish was. But first let me explain what we're looking at on the otolith. Um, as I mentioned earlier, fish do grow at different rates throughout the year. When there's lots of food available, availability and it's, there's water, warmer water temperatures in the summer, the fish grow pretty quickly. And the daily growth rings are more spread out due to the rapid growth, creating this translu translucent zone on the otolith that light can readily pass through. Um, in colder winter months, fish um, have less food availability and their growth slows down a bit. And those daily incremental bone layers stack up really tight on top of each other in order to create an opaque zone where light does not readily pass through. And it, it's that dark band there. Combined together, one translucent zone and one opaque zone equal one year of growth. So for simplicity, we simply count the number of opaque zones, those dark bands, on the otolith to determine the age. And we call those bands an annulus. To age this fish, we would start down inside the V. So the red just elucidated that you know image of a V on the otolith. That's a uh, called the Sokal Groove, it's where a nerve attaches to this otolith and sends information to the fish's brain and kind of creates this V-shape on the otolith. And that helps us because um, we're always looking for that all-important core. So we go all the way down to the tip of this V and that is essentially pointing to the core. And then we count our way up and out, uh, counting each dark band or annulus out to the margin or the edge. This fish was two. All right, so we're going to go through some aging examples together. I hope you guys are all with me. Um, we're going to determine how old this spotted sea trout is. So again, um, I told you to look for the V. That brings you down to the core. Um, you go down to the point, find the first dark band, the annulus, that's just outside the core, and then progressively count the dark bands um, as you move outwards towards the edge. And I'm going to... Get, we, we do have a poll set up, so I'm going to give it a minute so that participants feel free to type in some guesses. How old do you think this spotted sea trout is? Okay, I see some answers coming in. Looking good, guys. Keep them coming. We will go through it together here in a moment. <laughs> Somebody said it was like 100 million years old. That's good. <laughs> I wish they lived to be that old. All right. Well, if you answered four, the fours have it. Great job. Um, that's right. Um, so this trout was four years old, and those um, yellow dots are showing you the growth bands, the annuli that we would count there. And uh, this spotted sea trout was four years old, and the oldest spotted sea trout observed in Florida was 10 years old. So this is actually not an enormously long-lived species. Um, they really only live to be about 10 years old, in Florida at least. We're going to do another one together. We are going to go through a cobia otolith. Um, again, look for that sulcal groove in the V. Go down to the middle, the core, and count... Uh, the annuli working your way outwards towards the edge. Again, we have a poll set up, so go ahead and type in some answers. I'm seeing three, five. Someone really wants fish to live to be 100 million years old. I'm afraid they don't. <laughs> some live to be really long, though. We'll talk about that. Okay. All right. So this cobia was four years old. Um, our little dots are going to show you. Yep, there we go, those yellow dots. Those are the four dark bands we would count. Um, this cobia was four, but the oldest observed cob cobia fish in Florida was 15 years old. Um, while I was waiting for some of your answers to come in, I was actually going to share a fun fact with you about cobia. Um, they like to swim along with sharks and rays, and they're often mistaken as sharks themselves due to that sharp, pointy dorsal fin, which looks very sharky. Um, all right, we're going to do another one together. The common snook. I don't know if you guys are familiar, if you've been out fishing, if you've caught this fish. They're usually recognizable by that black stripe lateral line down their side. Uh, we're going to figure out how old this snook is. Again, look for the sulcal groove, the V. Go down to the core and count those rings as you move outwards. Okay, answers are coming Wild in. Coming in, yeah. Um, I want to tell you guys a fun fact about, guys fish. Fun fact about really? fish, uh, snook in particular. Did you know that all snook are actually born males, and then some of them change to females later in life, which is a pretty cool 
fact. Quite a few species of fish actually, actually have the ability to change gender once in their lifetime when they reach a certain size or on an as-needed basis for the population. It's pretty cool. Okay, let me check this poll. I'm seeing some answers come in. All right, if you said five, then you are correct. This is a five-year-old common snook, and they can live to be about 21 in the state of Florida. Awesome. You guys are pros. Great job. Get your sharp counting eyes on. We're going to give you a hard one. Oh, okay. How old do you think this red drum is? What do you mean? There's a lot of lines there. <laughs> We're being mean, yeah. Any guesses? I know 100 million kid is out there somewhere. I know this is his moment to shine. His or her moment to shine. 400 million, yep. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Oh, I see some close answers. Okay, all right, I've got some in the 30s. Uh, the correct answer is 35. Um, this was a 35-year-old red drum. All of our little yellow dots showed you every line we would have counted under the microscope. This is why sometimes it's easier under the microscopes. We can zoom in on whatever we need to zoom in on. Um, red drum are pretty cool. They can be long-lived. They can live to be 44 in the state of Florida. All right. You guys did great. You guys, I was on mute. <laughs> it's really impressive how long they can live. But uh, what's, what I'm sure you guys are all wondering is why does this even matter? Why do we need to know how long fish live? It's, um, how, why do we need to know how old they are at certain sizes? Why is this important? And what do we even do with all these numbers that we turn in at the end of the day? So what I'm going to do is actually walk you through a real example using mutton snapper to demonstrate how these ages are used to influence fishing regulations. First off, we use information from other scientists that by age three, all mutton snapper are mature, which we can see here inside the orange circle. The ages are across the bottom, and you can see at age three that the line reaches all the way up to the top of that graph, meaning most of them are mature by age three. So then we take this information to a growth curve. Again, ages are across the bottom, so we look for age three, and we see the average size of a three-year-old mutton snapper is around 450 millimeters, 457 to be exact, and shown by that orange line drawn across there at the average, which this is about 18 inches long. So you take that information, when you go to our website, you can see the minimum size that you can keep a mutton snapper is 18 inches. This ensures that the fish is already mature and has had the potential to reproduce at least once before being caught. If we caught these fish when they were too small, uh, they wouldn't have this chance and we'd run the risk of fishing them all out. So pretty important. It's also important that you, when you go fishing, stay informed on the rules and regulations, uh, which are on our website, and you can usually pick up a hard copy at most bait shops. All right. We want to thank you all for listening in and aging some fish with us. And we're going to open it up for questions. Share any questions you may have. We'll do our best to answer. Thank you guys okay. for joining us. All right. You guys, thank you so much, Brittany and Kristen. Thank you. I have to admit, I was actually pretty bad at counting the rings. So, um, I don't know. I'm going to have to come visit you someday. You're just down the hall from me, and uh, you're going to have to give me a lesson in person because it's pretty cool, but you don't want me in your lab right now. <laughs> so we have some questions. Um, feel free to use the Q&A pod if you, have any, um, if you have any questions. I have a couple to start with. So first question, how good do they hear? And I'm guessing by they, they mean the fish. <laughs> um, how good do they hear? Um, it's tough to gauge that, but um, some of the, the, the way it works within the fish is the otolith is floating within a fluid-filled sac with a nerve attached to it. And as this bone vibrates with sound, it sends those vibrations through the nerve to the fish's brain, and that's kind of how it understands and comprehends sound. Um, Sound is um, important to certain species of fish. Brittany had mentioned that about otolith morphology. Our um, members of the drum family have really big otoliths because sound is very important to them, and they generate sound using their swim bladder. 
Um, so as they kind of move muscles alongside their swim bladder full of air inside their bodies, that's kind of what makes a drum sound for a member of the drum family. And um, often these sounds are sent out during maybe spawning season and um, it gathers the fish together for their spawning. Um, Sound is uh, pretty important to fish, um, but like Brittany mentioned in morphology, it's not as highly important for the more pelagic fish um, that have excellent eyesight for seeing long distances, but not necessarily hearing long distance. Um, I hope that kind of answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question. Actually, I kind of love this one. Can they break their ear bone? Their ear bone. Well, uh, we, it's, we should mention that um, not all ear bones come to us perfect. Uh, sometimes there are malformities. Uh, so we can see like a weird crystallization process ha happen on an otolith, or we can see maybe um, bands that formed funny. Maybe they're blue. Sometimes like that will happen. We will see blue rings, or we will see um, that maybe an otolith got dislodged. Um, yes, maybe a bonk on the fish's head, and then it kind of reformed uh, from that point on in the position it was in. So we see these deformities just occasionally in a small percentage of our otoliths um, as they come through. So can the otolith break while it's within the fish's head? Those are those deformities I talked about, but um, they certainly, there certainly are very fragile otoliths that do come to our lab broken in half so we do have to take the utmost care to keep them whole and intact um, that would be the easiest way for us to process that otolith all right we have a couple of questions in here that are actually kind of similar so i am going to combine them into one and they're actually for each of you so several people would like to know um, what's the oldest fish that you have actually aged personally and then a second part to that is um what's the oldest fish you've ever found so i guess those all kind of go together what's the oldest one you each have found oh geez i don't even remember <laughs> how old was that warsaw that we did so we had a warsaw grouper come into the lab and it was 50. it was yeah, 50. 50. we we both actually got to look at that one which was pretty cool Um, for myself, I just recently aged a 42-year-old mutton snapper. Um, that was kind of a new record for mutton snapper. Previously, it had been 40. Um, so that's, I guess, personal best ages. <laughs> um, it's worth mentioning that um, our warm water fish are not necessarily the oldest lived out there. Cold water fish, um, cold deep water fish, um, let's throw out the rockfish in Alaska um, can be very long lived to be over a hundred years old. And we don't see um, that quite so much in Florida. Um, but we, we do see um, fish live to be a uh, red snapper can be in their forties, fifties. Um, there are some deep water groupers that can be in their fifties. So that's kind of just throwing out some max age, max ages that we've seen in this lab. Thank you. That's crazy. 50. Wow. That, that's a lot of rings to count. <laughs> Do you guys monitor sharks as well or just fish? Our lab is specific to bony fish. Um, so uh, sharks and rays are members of the cartilaginous fish, um, the fish that have bones that are softer, more pliable, like the cartilage in our ears and our noses. So they're not considered bony fish and they do not have ear bones, otoliths. Um, the way you age a shark is you actually take a cross section of its vertebra and you'll see lines banding on their vertebra. So that is how you age a shark. It is just not necessarily what we do here in this lab. We only work on bony fish. Gotcha. Um, someone in here actually has a great question. Who came up with the name Odalith? <laughs> you guys know? The Latin speakers. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I can only imagine that the first person who ever saw an otolith, I'm going to hold one up for you. I'm in our lab, so I'm going to hold one up for you. 
I, I can only imagine that when you see something like that, that it looks like a stone. Um, <laughs> what's interesting about otoliths is that um, if they're hardy enough like that, they hang around. Um, we have archaeologists who find them in archaeological middens, which would be the trash heaps where fish um, carcasses were tossed and the ear bones um, are retained in that trash pile for, you know, years and years and years to come. So it looks like a stone. Uh, so certainly I can make the easy jump that when somebody figured out it was part of the inner ear system of a fish that it would be called an ear stone. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. So, um, so how large can that otolith actually get? Like which, which fish, which species has the largest one and how big is it? Um, well, again, since I'm here in the lab, I have a, a display otolith to show you guys. Um, this is kind of one of our poster otoliths that we always like to haul out and show everyone. So to give you a size comparison, here's a candy corn. <laughs> and here is, um, this is a red snapper otolith. And I believe that this would be one of those that um, lived to be about 45. I hope it would focus for you. I'm not sure if it's going to focus. Um, you can see it pretty good. But yeah, this is about one of the biggest otoliths. You can see it's about as tall as the candy corn. <laughs> This, uh, this kind of a thick otolith would take us a very long time uh, to cut through. Another species that gets a really big thick otolith is um, the black drum. Again, a member of that drum family. And that's uh, this big, thick, dense um, otolith here. So those are some of our biggest otoliths that we see here. Okay, we're going to do one final question. Have you ever found a fish without an ear bone? Oh. Um... There are some with ear bones that are so tiny, we think they've disappeared. Um, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, we've worked on eel otoliths, which are about as tiny as uh, a piece of lint. <laughs> uh, there are some that are just very hard to find. Perhaps they are very small. Um, I'm not sure I could say that we ever encountered a fish that didn't have any. Um, malformities, sure, deformities in the otolith, maybe, um, but none without. Not in bony fish. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I do apologize if um, we weren't able to get to everyone's today. That is actually going to bring our session to an end. So Kristen and Brittany, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, sharing with us all about how you age fish. Thanks Super cool. Me. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We hope you guys had fun and learned quite a bit. Um, and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Bye.